women can succeed today in this world only if they're like men. There is no other way to succeed because they have to become masculine because the social significance or the world's… the significance of human societies has shifted from all other subtleties to one crudeness of economics. Wherever you go today, what is the conversation? Economy, can you beat it? At least they were talking about weather some time ago <laughs> <laughs> So it's a no-win situation for women. <laughs> no, women will… women may win, but feminine will lose out. Wow. Unless we restructure our societies, giving equal significance to all the subtler aspects of our life, where naturally feminine will become prominent and important in our lives. <laughs> That's powerful. It means we need to restructure society and I'll come later. Our it's priorities true. have to change. Yeah, and we have to start with everyone because I'll come to that because that is coming, <laughs> that is yet to come. Back to the family, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at uh, much of our societies in Africa, in Asia and, and all over the world, there is a struggle when it comes and I'll bring us back to, to, to feminine and masculine as in the gender. And we do see the prevalence of, of gender violence, something that we're dealing with uh, a lot. And for instance, even fighting ills such as female genital mutilation and trying to re-educate people, it's a huge issue. Um, within homes, how do we bring up young men who respect and love women? And how do we bring up young women who are confident and demand love and respect? How, how do we do that and break the current balance? It's very important that in childhood, the homes manage this well because it's an early age, if they pick up these things later on, it's very difficult for them to come to terms with this. Mm -hmm. I think that is changing rapidly in this generation. It has changed rapidly in this generation already, I would say, in many ways. Today, uh, it is… it's very common, at least in India, that the girls are doing way better than boys in most of the educational institutions mm -hmm. and a whole lot of parents choose to have girls rather than boys. You know, there's an ulterior motive in this. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. Because <laughs> uh, if you have a girl, you just have to take care of till she is maybe eighteen, twenty, twenty-five. Boy means you don't know, he may be on your hands forever. Oh dear, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Parents want to be done with the project at some time. Project children must be over yes, at yes. some point. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so things are changing, I think rapidly, very seriously changing. It is just that the violence within the families is unfortunate. Once again, it is… I would say it is not essentially against women. The violence is not against women. Right now, we have adopted this mentality. There's a whole lot of violence against children, irrespective of their gender. So what this shows is, we are willing to beat up anybody who is little weaker than us. Oh. Not necessarily women, I'm saying. So, this is always misunderstood as this is violence against a particular gender. No, no. If they find anybody little weaker than them, they'll beat them up. We're terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> no. It comes back to the consciousness and, and that is sad. Yeah, so this is because if you bring up a society, essentially on the identification of your physical form or your body, if I have a stronger body than you, naturally I think I can do things with it, all right? This is why spiritual process is important because spiritual process does not mean looking up or looking down or looking heavenward or something else. Mm -hmm. Spiritual process means your experience of life has touched a dimension beyond physical nature. Once your identification shifts to something beyond your physicality, then your physical dominance is not a significance… of any significance to yourself. 
when it's not of any significance to yourself, you will not try to manifest this in the world as a physical dominance. Mm. It is wanting to dominate. And now because we are identified with the body so much, we will try to dominate physically, which is experienced as violence by somebody else. Mm -hmm. But pushing somebody away and going, that person doesn't think it's violence, he thinks it's his right because he's bigger, of course. So, <laughs> wow. Um, staying within the home, Sadhguru, and the relationship dynamics of the family. In my family, um, I have one daughter and, and I have sons, many sons. See, you are also prejudiced. Oh, no, no! On, <laughs> on which side? On which side would you think? On which side would you think? On the male side. How did you know? So, okay, so in my family… You have four boys. Yeah, my do there we go. But my daughter is very close to her father. Do we have that in many families where the young lady can get anything from daddy, right? And, and my sons are very close to mommy. What happens in society that when they grow up, you would think then that a man always will treasure a woman. And, and you know, I, I think when, when families get it right, it, it doesn't go wrong later. Where do we get it wrong? Because clearly in parenting, there's something going wrong. Oh. <laughs> we must understand this. See, this is… that's why I said this is not against a particular gender. Mm -hmm. Well, a man wants a woman, all right. It's not that he's against her. Mm. Man-woman relationship is one relationship where there is too much overlap. You have to share everything from your bedroom to bathroom to including your bodies, <laughs> all right? Too much overlap. Even bank accounts, <laughs> yes <laughs> I wouldn't get into that. <laughs> See, going back to economics <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> So because there is so much overlap, mm. there is more room for conflict. It… it needs to be… it is a beautiful overlap only when there is an atmosphere of love. Yes. Once that's gone, when it's a transaction, this level of overlap is not healthy for a transaction. Mm. Mm. Transaction is good like this. This much overlap and so many things to transact on a daily basis, it is bound to cause friction. Only when there is a certain sense of love and devotion involved in this, then it… with that lubrication, mm -hmm. all this friction will go on <laughs> without much out… you know, manifestation of friction. Because the love dominates, yes. the love takes the space. Yes. So today when uh, we are thinking of marriages and relationships with an expiry date in our mind… <laughs> Do we? A whole lot of people are unfortunately, the world is coming to that. There was a time when people were anyway committed. When that commitment was there, things came up, problems happened, they fought, again tomorrow they were close and things went on. Okay, today morning quarreling, evening fine, night full of love and morning again quarrel, <laughs> things were going on, <laughs> I'm saying. Because there is such a serious overlap of two lives and there will be bound to be areas of friction. If your… every family comes up with their own devices of handling this friction and some people fail to come up with devices because there is not enough commitment. If it was very clear to you, hell or high water, you got to be with the same person, mm. then you would find ways to fix it. Right. Now you think if it doesn't work, she's finished. When this is there, you're unwilling to find ways because between any two human beings, if there is so much overlap, if we are not committed, then being together is difficult. Every small thing flares up into a big thing. Mm. Smallest things will blow up into a place where today of course it leads you to divorce or whatever. This is because there is no long-term commitment because we think there's always another option. Is it good, is it bad? It's not for me to say that. But I'm just exploring the problem <laughs> It's a big problem and I am focusing on family because really I, I believe it is the… it plays a pivotal role in society. And looking at the society we're living in and the children that we're bringing up,
It's so dynamic. If they're looking for positive information out there, they will find what they're looking for. If they're looking for negative information, they'll find it. It's easily accessible. Um, this highly digital world we're living in. What are the key things that you would say we need to teach this young generation to keep them firmly grounded? Hello to all the people in the upper regions. <laughs> See, when a child enters your life, it's like a bundle of joy which has entered your life, with a lot of pain of course. There's a lot of pain involved in bringing yes, forth. Yes, <laughs> I can attest to that, the women can attest to that. <laughs> uh, but when the child came, things that you would have never done in your life, you start doing. You can't sing if for nuts even in your bathroom, suddenly you start singing. <laughs> you can't even bend down and pick up something, you can't touch your toes, but you c crawl under the sofa along with your child. You know, you go under the furniture right. with him or her. Like this, many things, you sing, you dance, you play, you for moments at least, if not for good, for moments at least you forgot the concrete block that you have become and you became life once again, mm. all right? But somehow all the adults believe they have to teach something as soon as a child comes. So this is… people ask me, Sadhguru, what is your sadhana? You did not read scriptures, you did not go to a teacher, you did not learn anything, but you seem to know everything, how is it? I tell them, this is the only thing that I did in my life is, I made sure that I am not influenced by anybody around me, whether it's my parents or the culture around me or the teachers or every adult around, because every adult around you is trying to teach you something that's not worked in their life. Oh my goodness! <laughs> when I say something that's not worked in their life, between you and your child, if you look at it, who is more joyful? Your child. I'm asking who should be a consultant for life? <laughs> One who knows how to be joyful for no reason, he should be a consultant or one, even if everything is working your way, you carry a grave face and walk around the world, you should be a consultant for life, you must decide. So if a child comes into your life, it's not time to teach, it's time to learn. Once again, you could reinvent your life, you could learn what it means to be alive. Instead of learning what it means to be alive, People are carrying grave faces and going around. <laughs> grave is… grave will anyway come, you don't have to practice it on your <laughs> face. I was… I was speaking at the… you know, just a, about four weeks ago, I was speaking at the Stanford Medical University. Mm -hmm. I just looked around, there's many doctors who are sitting there, all… <laughs> many of them. I said, see, when you walk into your patient's room, Grave is one thing that you should not remind them of. <laughs> They're going, they might be getting there. So. <laughs> if somebody is not well in a hospital, you don't remind them of grave. It's very important that the doctor walks in with a different sense of vitality and life about him. So similarly, a child has come into your life means it's time for to live it up, once again to become fully alive, whatever your age. Your aliveness need not come down, isn't it? Our physical agility may come down with age, but why should your aliveness come down? If aliveness is coming down, it means you're committing suicide in installments. <laughs> That's what it means, <laughs> yes or no? Hello? <laughs> I'm talking to you, hello <laughs> Wow, that's powerful. So, <laughs> so children have come, time to understand how to make something out of nothing. That's what a child is. You leave him anywhere, he finds an ant and he finds it interesting enough 
to make a universe out of an ant. We've given you a bloody universe and you're making nothing out of it. <laughs> Everything you have today, compared to any other generation on this planet, you know more comforts and conveniences than any other generation ever before, isn't it so? Yes. But <laughs> why? <laughs> why means uh, because uh, traffic, Sadhguru, oh, traffic. <laughs> Well, you're sitting in your dream car, aren't you? <laughs> Enjoy it! <laughs> Traffic is helping you to stay in your dream for some more time <laughs> You know, what you've just told us is stop trying to teach your children and start learning from them start living. We're such a complaining generation of people. Oh, we are the most whining generation on the planet, <laughs> ever. You come to Kenya at a time when we have anti-something demonstrations, then we have anti-demonstration demonstrations, then we have anti-demonstration demonstration demonstrations, and, and you know, the ordinary Kenyan is caught in the middle of it wondering what's going on. So I must talk about political leadership for a moment, if you will allow me. Can we? For a moment. Yes. Sadhguru, what's wrong with our politicians? And so many... I'm, I'm just... The most basic question, right? In so many of our countries, and I think in many ways India is similar to Kenya, very vibrant countries, you know, alive and, and brimming with opportunity. We know what we must do, and we just never seem to be doing what we know that we must do. Why? Why? What's, what's wrong? <coughs> See, uh, I'm not saying many nations around the world, I'm not saying the best of men have reached leadership. No, it's not true. We have chosen a democratic system largely in the world. What this means is, uh, in, in Tamil language, democracy is translated as Jananayakam. This means people are the leaders, this is what it means. This means one among you, if you're willing to go through the works, you could become a leader, that's what it means. Oh, come on Sadhguru, where do I have a chance? Well, that's what it means that one among you, if you understand the system and you're willing to go through the works that it takes to get there, you could get there. Well, right now India has set a huge example like this. A boy who was selling tea in a railway station is our prime minister today <laughs> I'm, I'm not bowing down to the man, I'm not made like that. But I'm bowing down to this possibility, a boy who was selling tea in the railway station, he could even aspire to become a prime minister of such a large nation, which is a tremendous thing, never before possible in the history of this humanity, isn't it so? Yes. Never before such things were possible. So that's what democracy means. But are we actively making use of it? That's another thing. Most people, I don't know how you are in Kenya, I, I don't have the numbers, but I'm sure more than sixty percent of you or more than forty percent of you don't even go out and vote. Yes? So, that is just one day in five years. Even that you can't do. But democracy does not mean just casting your vote. Democracy means there are many instruments in the system that every day you are supposed to exercise, you are supposed to rule. You have appointed somebody to do the job, but you are supposed to rule. But you think it's his job to do, well he is doing it the way he knows it. You must be okay with it, you shouldn't complain. When you are unwilling to take responsibility for your own well-being and the well-being of your society and your nation, you shouldn't complain, isn't it? Because you're only sitting down for dole outs. This is what you get 
A beggar shouldn't complain, isn't it? <laughs> you are not behaving like a leader, you are not behaving like a Jananayaka, a leader, a people being leader. People are not behaving like leaders, are they? They are behaving like beggars. When you behave like beggars, you should not complain. You can crib in your corner, but you cannot complain <laughs> because you have no right to complain because you are not exercising the instruments of democracy as you should. About… like in India we have a saying, you only get the kind of leadership that you deserve. For in many ways we've been indolent, we've been sitting back and… you know, in India this is a thing, I'm sure in Kenya also, if you go to a tea shop anywhere, India is full of tea shops, okay? <laughs> If you go to your tea shop, the guy who's selling tea, making probably fifty, hundred cups of tea in a day, that's his job, he will tell you how prime minister should function. Mm. <laughs> and he knows. He, he and knows. he has the yeah, no, no, He knows. Yes, yes. And he not only knows that if you know some cricket, I know yes. <laughs> He will tell how uh, the Tindulkar, whoever, how he doesn't know the batting technique, how he should bat, <laughs> all right? He will… he will… has advice for everybody. Only problem is he doesn't know how to make good tea <laughs> This is a serious problem. Everybody knows how somebody else should do their job, but they don't know how to do theirs. So in a democracy, though all of us are responsible for the nation, the first and foremost thing for us to do is, whatever we are supposed to do, mm. we are supposed to do it really well, not just for my well-being, but constantly being conscious that this is for the well-being of my nation and my world. If this is not there, there is no democracy. There is only feudalism. You are a feudalist essentially, I'm saying most people are feudalists, only thing is they don't have a following <laughs> <laughs> And the moment, even when it comes to voting, this has happened in every nation, most people are voting in a committed way because of their religion or community or caste or creed or party lines, they are committed votes. If you go to United States of America, Republican, Democratic looks like two different religions and it's committed, they are two different gods. <coughs> A committed vote means democracy is ruined. Mm. Democracy can only happen if there is a considered vote. Every time it is a considered vote. If you vote for somebody, who your family votes for, you should not even know. That's what a secret ballot means. Now, if all of you decide together and go and vote to one person, that means there is no democracy. Feudalism in the guise of democracy. I think you're starting to untap what's going on here. <laughs> it's really, really fascinating. I want to take it a little bit deeper in. And you know what's interesting, Seth Guru, is that in Kenya, a lot of people do vote. Right? We have very Lots high… Uh, interestingly enough, we have high voter How much? Turnout. Sixty, seventy percent? Above, what you're voting? Actually, I, I would… Yes, it's… Seventy-five percent, Good. yes. Which is possibly in the, in the world is one of the most important… Once seventy-five percent of the people start voting, mm -hmm. this means you will get the leader that you want. Mm -hmm. This is what changed in India. Mm -hmm. Our voting percentages, percentages were just hovering around fifty. The moment it lead, led to over seventy percent voting, I think we are getting leaders that we want slowly. So, we get so it <laughs> the problem we still have, and I want your comment on this, please, Seth Guru, is the fact that for us, the vote almost has become so important that the next person's rights become irrelevant. And what I want and how I want it, hakiyatu, isn't it? But not hakiyako. Hakiyatu is my rights, but we don't say your rights too. We almost feel like we, you know, we are… we can trample on your rights to get ours. What do we do in a society like this? How do we re… rebalance? See, uh, I know when people spoke about civil rights, they spoke about it 
in an extreme condition of uh, apartheid or mm. in an extreme condition of injustice that was happening, that's a different thing. But in any society, the moment you talk about your rights, the moment you talk about your freedom, I think you're heading for ruin anyway. Because you have freedom only to the extent you're responsible. Instead of talking about what is my responsibility in making this happen, if you think what is my right, all you are seeing is how to milk your society or your nation to your benefit. It's not going to work. It then once we start milking, there will be somebody else who is capable of milking it better than you. When he milks it better than you, you say, oh, he is doing wrong things. No, no, he is doing it better than you, that's <laughs> all. <laughs> so, my essential work in the last twenty years has been with leadership, various levels of leadership, business leadership, bureaucratic leadership and social leadership and political leadership. My work has been largely to move people from their personal ambitions to a larger vision. Because what ambition means is, you have tweaked up your desire, but you have not tweaked up your competence. You don't have to worry about tweaking your desire. Human beings should only focus on tweaking their competence. But right from their childhood, I don't know what you're telling your children, right from their childhood in every family, they're telling them, you must become this, you must become that. No, you must only see how a child is empowered by competence and knowledge and capability. Mm. When this capability is there, he will do whatever is needed. No, no, I've already decided this is what I will do. Nobody needs it, it doesn't matter. This is what I will do. So right now, <laughs> I was just joking with them, you know, we are, we are running crematoriums in India because I saw that they were in such a bad shape. So we took that up, it's an important service when… because everybody dies one day and the way it happens there is so clumsy. So I thought, I'll take this most unpopular thing. They said, Sadhguru, why have you taken this? This is not good, this is very negative. So I said, uh, see, if you go like this, I'm going to brand it. Isha crematoriums, everybody is a customer <laughs> then stop bothering you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, See, we have decided what is better than something. Mm -hmm. Once you do this, I must tell you this, when my girl was growing up, she traveled with me wherever I went and even as an infant, one thing I told everybody is don't anybody try to teach her anything. No ABC, no one, two, three, no languages, no what is right, what is wrong, don't teach her anything. Just leave her alone. I made sure she was exposed to every kind of people. I stayed in the poorest of homes, you know, in tribal uh, huts. I stayed in the best possible homes in the world, all kinds of things, which gave her a sense of balance about people. Even today, anywhere you put her, she's just comfortable. With so much ease with any class of society, mm -hmm. she managed. And I made sure nobody teaches her anything. So when she was around thirteen years of age, she came up to me and she was emotionally disturbed about something. So she came up to me and said, you're teaching everybody something, not telling me anything. I… I wanted that moment to come <laughs> I didn't want to be a teacher to her. So I said, see, this is all you have to learn. This is all. Never look up to anybody. She looked at me. I said, even me. Never look up to anybody. Never look down on anybody. This is all. Once you don't look up to anything, not look down on anything, you will see everything the way it is. When you see everything the way it is, you will navigate through this life effortlessly. The moment… the moment you look up to something, you will exaggerate it. When you look down on something, you'll exaggerate the negative about it. If you don't look up or look down, 
you will see everything just the way it is and that's all that's needed. For every solution, for every problem that is there to find solutions, all that is necessary is we are able to see it just the way it is. But right now, we are thinking our problem is of our politicians. No, no, that politician was just one of us yesterday. Today, he's taken the trouble of getting there. You sat in the comfort of your home and commenting endlessly. <laughs> You're a running commentary about everything. Right. <laughs> but making bad tea, yeah. <laughs> true, true. So, um, I'm bringing us back for a moment to family, Sadhguru, and one of the things happening in Kenya with much of our young society is that we have a lot of single families. Do, how, how many single parent families, how many people are aware of this happening in society today? A lot of women are left with the burden of bringing up children and struggling through and, and it's really very sad. And I remember, I'm looking back at when I first got married and you know, um, you get very few lessons on marriage. You kind of get in and you have to kind of figure it out, <laughs> right? Um, and, and in many ways it took some time to understand that exactly what you've told us, when you know unconditional love comes from your partner, everything is solved. And so you put that first and you build up and you build up. A lot of young families seem to be going in without the tools to get through those really difficult, uh, tough times. Sometimes they don't even get to the point of, of marriage and family. What advice would you give young people courting or young people in a situation where they feel alone and abandoned and they're wondering, what's gone wrong? How do I get it right the next time maybe? Oh. <laughs> Love is important, right? Uh, yes. A lot of young people are watching this, so I'm just <laughs> thinking because they are having, uh, you know, eleven love affairs right now oh, no. on the Facebook. Okay. On Facebook? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they are trying parallelly eleven different love affairs, hoping one of them will fall into place. <laughs> we need to understand that certain… certain things don't get better with practice <laughs> Wow. It is… it is when men and women came together in marriage. I'm talking about another time, not to the current population, I'm talking about another time, all the oldies who are here. When men and women came together in marriage, they knew nothing about anything about each other. Mm. Even looking at a woman directly was a taboo and now for the first time they looked at this woman, everything was new and fresh. There was so much excitement, there was so much coming together, there was so much exploration and discovery. Though for millions of years people have done the same damn thing, <laughs> still for that individual everything was fresh and new and it was shared just between the two of them and all this stuff. This made it last. Now before you come to marriage, you've seen too much of life and you… in your mind you're comparing one and the other. Now long-term commitment becomes difficult. People come together either out of helplessness or greed most of the time because there are… it's a mutual benefit scheme. Wow. Back to… back to the economics of it, <laughs> Yes. No, not just economics. Mm -hmm. There are needs in a human being. Mm -hmm. There is a physical need, there is a psychological need, there is an emotional need, social needs, economic needs, all kinds of needs. To fulfill these needs, you make a deal. If you live with a deal, it's invariably going to be ugly. Deals are made and pick up what you want and go home. Then it's okay. What do you say? <laughs> you make a deal, you make your money and go home to a place which means something to you. When you're making deals at home, then it becomes ugly because there's no place to go or you'll find a place to go. Ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to come to you in just a, sh a moment because we do want to take your questions for Seth Guru as well. Um, I must ask you, this is your first trip to Africa? No, no, I've been. Oh, it, it, it's, oh you've been before? Yes, I've been in Kenya for three weeks at one oh, time. Oh, what do you think of the country? 
I… it was fantastic because I only met your animals <laughs> That's terrible. They say we are the warmest people in the no, world. No, no, I'm not… Say. I'm not saying people are terrible. I said I met only the animals and it was fantastic. This time I've come to meet the people <laughs> well done. I'm not on a safari this time. Well done, well done. I'm looking at um, hands now for questions for Seth Guru. Can I see any? I know your hands will be up later. I see there's one there. Great. A lady over there and if you could run across with a mic. As we're getting the mic, there I see people uh, This is a very it. bad level of prejudice. Yes. This young man raised his hand. Oh fast, no, where are you? you? Where are you? The lady. I didn't see you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's I promise right. you that you are next. <laughs> I promise that you're next. Ah, oh, yes, I see hands. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. And the mic is… the mics are coming down. Excellent. Wonderful. I, wa I want to get as many questions for him. I know people have come far and wide to ask. So, thank you. We'll start then with the gentleman since… No, no. You, the lady can ask. It's fine. I just… Oh, I, she's got it. I'm Excellent. just pointing out to you. Okay. We've got it. We've got it. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Namaskaram Sadhguru. My name is Riya Sharma. And I had the privilege to interview you on behalf of East FM. Oh. <laughs> yes, so I'm indeed very honored, very humbled to be in your presence this evening. My question um, is about yoga. And of course, inter ahead of International Day, we're very privileged to have you here in Nairobi. My question is about um, the benefits of yoga, which everybody talks about. And, you know, everybody knows that yoga has great benefits for the inner well-being as well as the external. However, in Nairobi, with all due respect to certain people who are in the craft, I notice that housewives overnight turn into yoga gurus because they watch some DVDs, they watch a few programs on TV and then decide to start teaching yoga. Oh, really? Yes. And um, that is, of course, a big concern because People do understand the benefits of yoga, but they don't understand that if you're going to be training under somebody who's not quite qualified in the craft, what are the disadvantages? So I'd possibly please request you to highlight what the disadvantages of practicing with, I'm sorry the term may sound harsh, but a quack yoga teacher would be. Thank so you. So harsh. I just sound yeah. so harsh. But go ahead. Go ahead. They're all ladies, she said. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me… let me clear this a little bit because one thing is, as you said, yoga is not a craft. As there is a science and technology to create external well-being, there is an understanding of external situations which we call a science and a technology or a methodology through which we can create external well-being. Right now, this hall is, you know, we are controlling the climate with conditioning. Outside climates can be controlled like this. What about the inner climate? So the technology to create the inner climate, to create the inner ambience of who we are is yoga. It's a science and a technology at the same time. There's an exploration and there's a method. The dangers of not doing it properly are many. I don't want to explore that now, so close to the International Day of Yoga and put off people <laughs> uh, But we must understand, when we say yoga, however innocuous it may look, whatever the practice that is being taught, it always has a spiritual dimension attached to it. I don't know if… It's okay if I tell you my own story. Please, please, that's how, why we are here. How I got into the yoga for wrong reasons. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> please. This happened when I was just twelve years of age. I was in my ancestral home, my grandfather's place. This is a place where all the kids have assembled from many cities for our vacation time. Mm -hmm. So one of the sport for the boys is, to jump into a well which is about eight feet in diameter and about 
150 feet in depth because we always went there in summers, the water is down by about 60 feet drop or 70 feet drop in that range. So we want to jump in, you have to jump in properly. If you go somehow, your brains will become a smear on the wall. <laughs> and there is no steps or grip or anything, just holding the rock, you want to come up. It was hard and just the sheer pressure of it would make my fingers, all my fingernails bleed mm. because all my weight is at the tip of my fingers. And I was pretty good at this. One day we are doing this and a man who was over seventy years of age was watching us. Of course we ignored him, he was too old to be alive in our experience of life <laughs> Not now, I'm saying at that time. <laughs> When I thought even twenty is too old. Yes. <laughs> so this man without uttering a word went and jumped into the well. I thought he's finished. But he came up faster than me and I didn't like it. So I asked him how. He said, come and do yoga. I followed him like a puppy. So I'm saying I got into it for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. But somehow this became so much a part of me, I did not even think of doing it, but not a single morning ever passed without yoga happening. I am using the word yoga happening because when I look back and see, I never made up my mind I must do this. It simply took me over from inside and things happened like this. And uh, twelve years later, Something so phenomenal happened to me that everything changed. Why I am saying this is, the nature of this existence is such, even for the wrong reasons, if you do the right things, the right things will happen to you. That's how world is made, that's how the creation is made. So, doing it right is very important because there are many dimensions attached to it. I went into yoga only for physical prowess. After I got into it, I came to know there were other aspects to it which were psychological or mental. So physical and mental prowess, this is all my thing. I never imagined nor did I ever know there is another dimension to it altogether. But there is always that dimension to it. So when we transmit yoga, there is a spiritual element to it. This is the reason, for example, now for this International Yoga Day, when we teach, the Isa Foundation does not teach yoga in such large scale ever. We teach what is called as Upa Yoga. The word Upa Yoga literally means either sub yoga or pre yoga. But in Indian languages, today the word Upa Yoga is being used as something useful. But actually the word originates from this that we made yoga in such a way, we took out that aspect of yoga which has physiological and psychological benefits but no spiritual element to it. When we are transmitting soul such a large scale, it's best to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that she mentioned this and you are interested in children with your mm -hmm. footprint, yeah. about four months ago it came to my notice that a little over nine thousand children committed suicide in India below eighteen years of age. In the age groups of ten to fourteen, seventeen hundred children committed suicide in the last one year. When I heard this, see, no life does not value its own life. You try to catch an ant, it will do everything possible to save its own life. It does not think, ah, this is just an ant's life, let it go. There's no such thing. Every life intrinsically values itself as the highest thing, isn't mm. it? But a child, a child is an exuberant life. A child is a bundle of joy. A child is a fresh life. Mm. If a child wants to take his own life or her own life, then we are doing something fundamentally wrong with our lives, isn't it? 
something very fundamentally wrong in a society if children start committing suicide. I want all of you to look at it this way, it's not like statistics, nine thousand whatever is not a number. Suppose in our lives, our children in our home committed suicide below fourteen years of age, can you ever overcome that, I'm asking? If they died of disease or accident or something, that itself is difficult but somehow we will come out of that. But if they commit… if they took their own life, we clearly, clearly know we've done something fundamentally wrong, isn't it? So we should know we're doing something fundamentally wrong in a society when children start taking their own lives. So when I heard this, it was deeply disturbing. Why are our children killing themselves? Then I said, after cuff, I said, we must touch at least ten thousand schools and bring Upa Yoga to their life. And that day ten thousand looked like a big number. Mm. Then I traveled these nine states and met all the chief ministers and the education ministers and things like that. All of them responded with such enthusiasm. For this yoga day, in the next two months, we are initiating Upa Yoga in over thirty thousand schools. Mm. And the significant aspect of this is, we are not training the children, we are training the teachers. We… our own teachers, we have trained forty-five thousand six hundred teachers. These teachers are imparting this to the school teachers. In every school, two to three teachers are being trained. Above all, we made an elaborate video. For a twenty-minute practice, we made an elaborate video about showing how it should happen. So these newly trained teachers will only correct the practice, they will not literally teach the practice. All they have to do is, they have to correct. We train them for a day to understand what are all the wrong things that people can do mm -hmm. and correction. And these children will go through this just not for one day, five days of the week through the entire year, probably for the entire school time, this will go on. And we are trying to also involve parents wherever we can. Teaching yoga irresponsibly, if you… right now, this is the most important need, that is… See, in terms of external technologies, we've hit the ceiling, all right? Whether you buy your iPhone Z8 or not, that's the next model coming up <laughs> You still don't know how to use your iPhone 4 fully. <laughs> that's a fact, believe me. You still not explored the full range of things the damn thing can do, yes or no? Too many you're things. Right, you're right. So whether the next level of phone comes or computer comes is not the issue. Upgrading human beings is the most important thing that needs to happen in the world. So in this effort, this International Yoga Day I see has been a phenomenal step, mm. moted by our Prime Minister, but United Nations took this up. So these things that we have, if I can elaborate on this a bit. See, human intellect is sparking like never before. Never before in the history of humanity, this many people could think for themselves. Yes? Now once this happens, logical questions arise. Once logical questions arise, so many things which were taken for granted, which kept people in some kind of control within themselves, if not liberated, at least controlled within themselves, is all going to collapse. Heavenly solutions will collapse, believe me. No, I'm not talking about you guys up there <laughs> That's quite safe <laughs> When people start asking questions, heavens will crumble. It's bound to happen. If you don't pull it down, your children will, believe me. Things that you believe, your children refuse to believe, yes or no? because unless it makes logical sense to them, they're not going to take it. Whatever the authority, you can say the scripture says this, you can say God said this, you can say somebody said this, they're not going to take it unless it makes sense to them. This is a very positive development in the world because this means truth will be our authority. Authority will never be the truth. Mm -hmm. This is the future of the world. 
So, this International Yoga Day is at just at the right time and when the Prime Minister mooted this idea, as it was… as she was saying, 177 countries came together, it was almost like the world was waiting for it. It was waiting for India to take a step, but we took such a long time because you know we are a little large nation, we take time <laughs> to take steps <laughs> But it was almost like the entire world was waiting for somebody to say this because everybody knows, if they may not have consciously addressed it, but everybody knows tools for self-transformation are needed. And tools for self-transformation should not be in the hands of a guru or an organization or some other higher authority somewhere, no. Tools for self-transformation should be in the hands of every individual. I'm asking you a simple question, don't feel offended. Do you know, all of you brush your teeth today? Yes. <laughs> Hello? Yes. yes. This is because you have your own brush, the instrument necessary for cleaning your oral hygiene to take care of that, you have it. Suppose it was in the hands of the Kenyan government. <laughs> they fixed up. In hundred different places in Nairobi, you can go and have your teeth brushed. <laughs> Probably you would do it once a month. Yes or no? Because you have to stand in a line to have your teeth cleaned up. Only because it's in your hands, as it's necessary, you will take care of it, isn't it? Similarly, tools for transformation, which are logically correct, scientifically ascertainable, these kind of tools for transformation which does not demand any philosophical adherence, which does not be, uh, demand belief system, which does not come from any authority but from your own understanding of your system, mm. this is needed for the world. The time is very ripe because human intellect is sparking like never before. You can't bring our so-called well-being by telling them a philosophy. It's not going to work. It's already not working. Because it's not working, you see a rapid movement of people seeking chemical solutions. Mm. To be peaceful means have a drink in the evening, it's become a norm. I'm asking all of you, whatever your age, in the last twenty-five years, don't you see at least a five hundred percent increase in the consumption of alcohol and drugs and psychiatric prescriptions. Yes. This means we are moving towards madness <laughs> Yes. See, for example, a maximum period or a longest period of economic well-being compared to any other society in the world. But today, thirty-nine percent of the European population is under psychiatric prescription medi medication. Three hundred and fifty million people, year on year, they are consuming prescription medications for psychiatric problems. So with economic well-being, there is no guarantee that you will get human well-being. If human… if economic well-being has to translate into human well-being, you need tools for transformation within every individual because the possibility of economic well-being taking us to ruin is very much glaring in our face. In pursuit of human well-being, we've ripped the planet apart, isn't it? Just today afternoon they were telling me that only seven percent of Kenya is under forest cover. Oh my God, I'm… believe me, everybody in the world believe Kenya means ninety percent forest and Nairobi <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that is the image everybody has, mm. but they told me seven percent, that is… that is horrific, I'm telling you. It's not a simple tragedy. You don't know what is the kind of disaster that… disaster that can evolve out of seven percent green cover mm. in any nation. In a continent which everybody believes is full of jungles, full of nature, full of wildlife, Everybody believes this. If only seven percent under green cover, that's tragic. Even India is better than this. Mm -hmm. With the kind of population pressure we have, 
even the percentages of green cover in India is way better than this. So, when we go like this, we must understand for a long time we looked up in search of well-being. Mm -hmm. People became delusional and my delusion and your delusion fought battles and wars and still going on. Many people can't give it up yet. Mm. Yes? Now, from heaven we shifted our focus to get our well-being from outside. Once our uh, focus shifted to the outside world, we started ripping it. Don't think there is some other reason. It is all in pursuit of human well-being, isn't it? Mm. Everything we have done is in pursuit of human well-being. But in the last hundred years, though we have rip the planet bald, not because of age, simply because we plucked it out. Have we achieved well-being, I'm asking you? They are telling me the world food industry is 7.6 trillion dollars. The pharmaceutical industry is 7.2 trillion dollars. And the, by the end of 2017, they say pharmaceutical industry will be bigger than the food industry. That means we are eating more medicine than food. We can't claim we're well. 